All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. The first question the uh, schoolmaster asked the boy when he went to see him, he said, son, tell me, what kind of people were there, were they uh, in the city or town you left? So the little boy said, well, master, he said they were uh, cruel, they were nasty, and when I was sick, they didn't even visit me. He said, they're the same here, son, keep on going. So the boy ran away to another town, then he went into the village schoolmaster again. And the village schoolmaster said, um, uh, what uh, kind of people were they in the town you left? Well, he said, they beat me, they were cruel to me, and uh, when I was in the hospital, they didn't even visit me. And my parents, he said, they were very cruel, and they beat me mercilessly. He said, they're the same here, son, keep on going. The next town, he went into the village schoolmaster, and he told the same story. Village schoolmaster said they're the nasty here too. They're ugly people here, just like they were in the town you came from. Keep on going, son, and you'll find the right town. So on the way, uh, the he began to ask what is called Dao. Dao means God in China, and he asked God for guidance to put the words into his mouth. Then the next town he went into, of course, he went to the village schoolmaster, and he said to the village schoolmaster, what kind of people are in this town? So he asked him the same question. He said, son, tell me, what kind of people were they in the town you left? Well, he said, they were kind, they were gracious, they were lovely to me. When I was sick, they visited me, they gave me, brought me soup, and they were kind, they gave me money when I left, and all that. He said, they are wonderful, wonderful people. He said, they're the same here, son. This is the town for you. Stay here. Well, now, what does it mean? It means we meet ourselves wherever we go. For the world we see is the world we are. We're always looking out through the contents of our own mentality. Down through the ages, we've had people promoting utopias of all kinds, you know, such as socialism, communism, communes, islands in the sun, where all of us would live in peace and harmony and where love would reign supreme and we share the wealth and all that sort of Tommy rot, which is all it is. We've had these utopias down through the ages. You know very well what happened to them, just as well as I do. The share of the well business. When we look around us, we find thousands who risk their lives to escape from the so-called utopia of East Germany. Yes, uh, they wanted to get to West Germany. We find people want to leave Russia. We want the same China or all these other places where it's supposed to be a paradise on earth. Millions would like to get out of these so-called utopias. If men practiced the golden rule and the law of love, we wouldn't need any uh, utopias or Garden of Edens or things of that nature. It would be heaven on earth. We've had the golden rule in all Bibles of the world. We've also had love thy neighbor as thyself. We've had all these things. And if we practice the golden rule, as you would that men should do to you, do you so to them in like manner? What you would not do to another, do not do to them. Uh, do not do to them. Yes, that's right. Uh, so you treat the other as you would like to be treated. And of course, if men practice that, there'd be no occasion for war. Sickness, disease, there'd be no occasion for armies or navies or soldiers or anything. It'd be heaven on earth, as simple as that. But you can quote the golden rule, but if you practice it, then we wouldn't need any of these things. We wouldn't need any armed forces or nuclear weapons or anything. Um, these truths have been taught for thousands of years, so has the great law of love. So you've had Paul's epistle greatest anthology in love ever written. We've had that too for 2,000 years. We've had the golden rule for 10,000 years. But you see, man acts according to his conditioning, according to his fears and hates and prejudices. If he is governed by ignorance, this produces strife and suffering. As Buddha, you know, in his meditation asked the God presence, for the cause of all the suffering and the misery and the crime in India. 
You know what the answer was? Ignorance. So ignorance is the only sin, and all the suffering and the misery in the world is the consequence. Of course, that's true. Not true because Buddha said it, but it's true because it is true. Ignorance is the only sin, and all the suffering is the consequence. Teach a man his unqualified capacity in God to go within and claim guidance, inspiration, wealth, prosperity, success, true play. And you've given him the key, haven't you? The infinite intelligence responds to him. It opens up new doors for him. He doesn't want uh, to hurt anybody in the world because he's found the source within himself. He can find wealth and true place and expression, healing and everything else under the sun. So ignorance is the only sun, per contra. Knowledge of the laws of mind and the way of the spirit will produce health and happiness and peace and abundance and security. Because you know, when you say infinite intelligence leads and guides me, guides me, it responds to you. When you say divine right action is mine, it responds. You say infinite intelligence revealed my hidden talents to me and opens up a new door for me where I express myself at my highest level and exercise my faculties at the highest degree. It opens up that door for you. I hold before you an open door no man can shut. The nature of infinite intelligence or responsiveness now you're tapping your deeper mind. I've given you the key. You don't want what any other man has had. You don't want his cow or his ox or his donkey or anything that is his because you can go to the source and claim the same thing. Whatever you claim and feel to be true, the spirit will honor, validate and execute it. it is, this does away with all jealousy and all envy and everything unlike it. A detail man went to see a doctor friend. A detail man is a usually a pharmacist. He's now he has knowledge of chemistry. He was representing a chemical concern who brought who which had brought forth a new chemical for a particular disease. The doctor was a friend of his. He played golf with him, played cards with him. The doctor was very insulting, criticized him and his and his presentation criticized the company, the pharmaceutical company, and he was aghast, you know, disturbed, and leaving, the nurse said, oh, she said, don't pay any attention uh, to him this morning. His only son died on the operating table last night, and everything they tried failed. So the detail man said, oh, I understand. Um, notice how the irritation the inner disturbance uh, drops away when we hear of the sorrow, the grief, or the tragedy in the life of another person. The heart melted a little bit, and love took over. So he understood. To understand all, you know, is to forgive all. Uh, so that's a French aphorism. It's very true. A few years ago, I read about a woman who called the police and said her husband threatened her with a gun. And the police, of course, the police came, but no gun was found in the house. The newspapers took it up. The woman was very angry. They had a violent quarrel. Under that irrational emotion, she called the police. And she said he threatened to shoot her, to kill her. The publicity in the local press ruined the man professionally. She was very sorry. She regretted it but the damage had been done. This is what irrational emotion does. Uh, negative emotions compel you to act them out. When you want to be nice, you're ugly. When you want to succeed, you fail. Emotions kill. Emotion cure. He that is slow to rot, you see, overcome it much. You know. uh, yes, because you realize that there is a power within you that gives you peace and quietness and confidence shall be your strength. So she regretted having damaged her husband's reputation. Um, she was a victim of an irrational force called anger and emotions compel us to act them out. Many people are driven by passions and angers and hates and are victims of their own irrational emotions. 
The answer is to ask yourself, is this infinite intelligence and divine love thinking, speaking, acting through me? And if not, desist and tune in with the infinite, realizing infinite intelligence is my guide, my counselor, my way show, my troubleshooter. His peace fills my soul. This presence is the infinite peace and absolute harmony. And I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. This is the impregnable fortress. It is my unassailable citadel. Here I dwell beyond time and space. Here I am in tune with the infinite, which lies stretched in smiling repose. And I know that to be alone in the silent is to be alone with God. No one can lay siege to me there. This divine contemplation supplants all negative thoughts and emotions and heals you. It's called supplanting. You can supplant it. When the room is dark, you turn on the light. For darkness is the absence of light. It is impossible to know all the complexities of other lives. We don't know about their early training, their indoctrination, their religious taboos and strictures, their conditioning, which caused them to be ugly or full of hostility. Sometimes false religious beliefs and hatred towards other religious beliefs have conditioned the minds of millions. And uh, they fight over their religious beliefs, you know, many parts of the country today, as you know. Uh, <clears throat> but religion should give you joy, should give you peace, should give you happiness. For in him there is fullness of joy, in him there is no darkness at all. Heretofore you have asked for nothing, now ask that your joy might be full. So these things have I said unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and your joy might be full. And the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and, and happiness. And these are the powers that are within you. And, and therefore you have this wonderful opportunity to radiate love, peace, and goodwill to all mankind. It costs you nothing. It pays fabulous dividends. You, it, sometimes <clears throat> when you go up into the forest area, you see uh, the trees are straight as a die, and uh, one particular tree is gnarled and twisted. Oh, maybe there was a fence there when it was a sapling, or a boulder, maybe boys twisted it, sat upon it, but anyhow, the cause is gone, but the effect remains. Likewise, we have twisted, distorted, warped mentalities. Perhaps all this started in their childhood. In parts of the world, Protestants are taught to hate Catholics and Catholics are taught to hate Protestants. It's like the Irishman that went over to Ireland, you know, spent some months there. When he came back, they asked him, how did he find things? Well, he said, the Catholic hates the Protestant, little boys of seven are throwing stones at soldiers. And he said their uh, little girls, seven and eight, he said they're also learning to throw grenades at Protestants and the Protestants against the Catholics and the Catholics against the Protestants. He said it's frightful. And he said, I wish they were all heathen so they might live together like Christians. Well, of course, there's some humor in that, but he's pointing out the state of mind, the conditioning. And we have Muslims and Hindus and people of religious beliefs fighting each other. We've had religious wars down through the ages. But uh, true religion gives you joy. But true religion is being that bound by a God of love. So when a God of love is enthroned in your mind, it dominates all other thoughts, feelings, beliefs, actions, and reactions. And that's the ideal religion. Then the fruits of that spirit are love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Because you must demonstrate what you believe in. You must show forth 
what your religious belief is. It must appear in your body, in your home, in your pocketbook, in your relationship with people, your art, your science, your industry. Where is it? You uh, demonstrate what you believe in, you know. Man is belief expressed. Now, you wouldn't resent or be hostile to hunchback or a person with a congenital deformity. The twisted, distorted mentality often attacks those who have been kindest to him. The reason being their inner peace and serenity and tranquility and poise throws his seething unrest into bold relief. Therefore, he unconsciously desires to drag them down to his disturbed mental state. He would deny that, but nevertheless, it's absolutely true. Misery loves company. Why should they be so happy and peaceful when I'm so miserable? So he likes to drag you down you, to his own level. Never become enmeshed in the negative mental vibrations of others. Don't let them drag you down. If you do, then you're contaminated by that negative destructive mood. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and the measure ye meet shall be measured to you again. All of us can avoid mental pain, anxiety, and tension by ceasing to pass judgment on our mind. Marcus Aurelius said 2,000 years ago, where there's no opinion, there's no suffering. Where there's no judgment, there's no pain. So you have no judgment, you have no pain. If I have white sock and a black sock on on the platform and you happen to see it and you're disturbed, who's disturbed? You are. I don't even know I have them on. You're disturbing yourself. Uh, <clears throat> you're the cause of your own suffering. If you get all upset about what some politician, some president or some senator said or did or did not do, who is suffering? You are. And of course, you know, you are the cause of your own suffering according to your judgment or decision which is arrived at in your own mind. Therefore, you are the cause of it. Let your opinion be still. If the cucumber is bitter, don't eat it. If there are briars or brambles on the road, avoid them. So, no judgment, there is no suffering. Um, there's nothing hidden that is not revealed, nothing covered that is not made known. So if you get all excited and agitated about what the columnist said in the morning newspaper, well, he has freedom to write that. You have freedom to write a constructive letter negating the whole thing and telling him all the reasons why you disagree. But you're emotionally mature. At least you should be spiritually mature and realize that he's writing from his own standpoint and you have perfect freedom to disagree with him. You also have freedom to write a constructive letter to your senator or congressman or board member, as the case may be, and telling him uh, what you think and what you believe and why a criminal shouldn't be allowed to roam the earth because of some technicality and why rapists should not be let loose under some technicality either. Uh, you can do all these things in a constructive way. Uh, <clears throat> but if you get all exercised and agitated about it, you're looking for trouble. And who's trouble? You are. Who's hurt? You are. They're dancing under the midnight stars and they're prospering like the Green Bay tree. At a conference, don't puncture the ego of another person. There's no point in deflating him. Maybe his idea is foolish. But you, all you do is generate hostility. You could say, your idea is interesting. It, uh, we should be explored. This is my idea, may not be better, but I look at it this way. You're respecting the other, and he will in all probability show you some respect because you show him respect. You're, we're all sons of the Most High, you're daughters of the Infinite, we're child of eternity. He that humbled himself shall be exalted. He that exalted himself be humble. So you don't say, you don't write roughshod over people and say, well, I believe it, and therefore you should believe it. This is my opinion, you must take it. No, you say, let the infinite think, speak, and act through me. 
The words are given to me by the higher self within me. The words of the infinite are given to me at that hour I shall receive them. They'll be words of wisdom, truth, and beauty. They radiate love, peace, and goodwill to all those at the conference and all those at the meeting. You show respect for all of them, and you just bring forth your idea. But you don't ridicule or puncture the ego of another person or deflate him. All he does is resent you, become antagonistic, and it doesn't do him any good. It doesn't do you any good either. Respect him. Um, he's acting according to the levels of his mentality. Rely on the infinite to prompt you and guide you. Uh, a husband used to come home and criticize his wife. Find fault with her hair, you know, the food, the way she was bringing up the children. She began to cry copiously. And the tears brought satisfaction to him. Because you can be sadistic with your tears, you know, not just with your tears, but you can also be sadistic with your words, you know. You can get a, into a crying jag and say, oh, you're killing me. Uh, you're giving me a heart attack and you're the cause of all my suffering because I want to practice emotional blackmail. I'm trying to get you to do what I want you to do. That moment I'm selfish. I'm tyrannical in my attitude of mind. It's called emotional blackmail. Don't yield to that kind of tears, you know. But there is the man who criticizes his wife and gets these tears from her. That's what he wants. And uh, then you tell the wife, you better wake up. And then I said, tell him that he no longer can disturb you by his remarks. That he gets a release by that. And then she says to him, I'm on to your game. Your criticism can no longer disturb me because the movement of my own thought and I, I go back to the infinite, which is my guide and my counsel. I'm going to sing a hymn. I'm going to vacuum the floor. I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to tune in. And, the, and he who is, the one alone who lives in the hearts of all men. Then, uh, she's unmoved, undisturbed. He gets no thrill out of it anymore. He stopped doing it. Uh, so it wasn't, you see what he said, it was her thought about it. It was the movement of her own thought. So the suggestions, statements and actions of others have no power to disturb you. It's the movement of your own thought all the way. It's your thought about it. Paul says, none of these things moves me. There are those who enjoy being hurt by others. There is the Irish woman who was beaten up by her husband. He'd come home drunk and beat her up, you know. Finally, he beat her up so much that he was arrested by a bobby. And the bobby, uh, English in England, they called the bobby a uh, policeman. They called the policeman the bobby. And he was arrested. And the judge said to the woman who was in the court, Have you anything to say before we pronounce sentence on your husband? Oh, she said, Your Honor, I love him so. He said, uh, Madam, you don't know what love is. England doesn't love him. He gets three years in jail. Um, love doesn't punish. Love doesn't do anything unloving. The poor woman hated herself and she wanted someone to punish her. And he used to punish her. So um, uh, that's wrong. Uh, love doesn't do anything unloving. Love frees, love gives, love the spirit of God. The children of love are peace and harmony and joy and goodwill and kindness and honesty and justice. These are children of love. If you love a woman or a man, you love to see him as he ought to be, happy, joyous, and free. You don't do anything unloving. You don't pass cutting remarks. You don't criticize. You certainly don't beat her up and things of that nature. So, um, so love is of God and God is love. When you love another, you see the presence of God there. You claim what's true of God is true of that person. That would be called love. Then there are those who like to needle others. There is the woman who comes up to the other, you know, on a Sunday morning and says, she's talking to a friend, and said, I heard you had an operation. It must have been terrible. And the woman didn't want anyone to know she had an operation or anything else. You see, then you have to look at such a person and realize their frustration. You have to understand them, to understand all is forgive all. Realize they're frustrated, they have inferiority complex, they feel inadequate, 
they get some sort of a sadistic, morbid satisfaction out of hurting you, but you can't be hurt. You say, God indwelled me, walks and talks to me. God is my guide. And then, uh, <clears throat> you're immunized. Then you're God intoxicated. They can't hurt you. You know, the prince of this world, you're told, come and find nothing in me. And the prince of the world is fear, isn't it? And ignorance. And the suggestions of others have no power to create the things they suggest. Your Bible tells you, call no man on earth your father. There's one which is your father, which is God. And God is a spirit within you, invisible, timeless, and shapeless. It's the life principle you started your heartbeat. And after all, it animates and sustains you, takes care of you, and you're sound asleep. When you walk down the street, a spirit walking down the street. When you lift a chair, a spirit lifting the chair. Your body doesn't do anything. Your body moves and moves upon. Your body acts as acted upon. Father is the progenitor, the creative power. There's only one creative power, not two or three or a thousand. Uh, so you don't make another person a cause. One is your father, which is the living spirit. Uh, does another spark your unredeemed aggressiveness? Um, so, does someone hurt your pride? Someone said to Will Rogers, you know, one of my antecedents came over in the Mayflower. So Will Rogers said, well, our, my antecedents, he said, met them at the boat, you know. So, uh, you're proud of your spiritual heritage, of the divinity which shapes your ends, for God is the Father of all. And therefore, you're proud of your spiritual lineage, because your know, children come by you, come through you, but not by you. Our Father is by all religions of the world, meaning we have a common progenitor, a common Father. Therefore, you're proud of your spiritual lineage and your heritage, for all the qualities of the infinite are within you. All the powers of God are within you. I said ye are gods, and all of your sons are the Most High. And you're told that over and over again. Paul says you're the temple of the living God. And the Spirit of God indwells you. And God is Spirit. And they that worship Him, worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's why you worship no man. Therefore he that is greatest among you, let him become your servant. So look at all the men who served humanity. Whether it's an Edison or Marconi, or no matter who it was, or a Lincoln. We honored them all. We build monuments to them. We speak about them because they contributed to the um, blessings of humanity. They gave much to people. You can radiate love, peace, and goodwill to all people. They require nothing from people. Expect nothing from people. Your expectation is from him who give it to all life, breath, and all things. Then you'll never be disappointed. My soul, wait thou upon God. My expectation is from him who give it to all life, breath, and all things. Uh, what you expect is what you get. So you expect the riches of the infinite. You expect guidance, harmony, health, peace, joy, abundance, security. You expect marvelous and wonderful things. For all things be ready, if the mind be so. So you're living in the mood of expectancy. You live in the joyous expectancy of the best, ineluctably, inevitably. The best must come to you, because you get what you expect. Yes, so release them all unto the infinite. Release everybody. Wish for them health and happiness and peace, and all the blessings of heaven. And uh, realize also that infinite intelligence guides and directs you in all your ways. It's a lamp unto your feet always. It's a light upon your path. And divine law and order governs your life. Divine peace fills your soul. And if you are dealing with difficult people, you find you have trouble with them. So release them all, mention their name, and to the infinite which created them. This God presence takes them out of my life and takes me out of their life in divine law, in divine order, through divine love. And all its ways are pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Uh, the Bible says, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. 
If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. To believe is to accept something as true. Great numbers of people who ever believe that which is absolutely false. Consequently, they suffer to the extent of their belief. To believe is to accept something as true, to live in the state of being, to be alive to something. Believe in the goodness of God and the land of the living. Believe in the guidance of the infinite. Believe in the riches of the infinite. Believe in a God of love, watching over you, sustaining and strengthening you. And according to your belief is it done unto you. If, for example, you believe that Los Angeles is in Arizona, and you dress your letter accordingly, you will go astray. Remember that to accept something is to accept it as true in your mind. Believe in the goodness of God in the land of the living, and all your ways will be ways of pleasantness, and all your paths will be paths of peace.